Thank you. Welcome back. 114 years ago, India was told a lie. The British had two great scams running in India. The first scam was called, quite clinically in economics, simply as carry trade. What was the great British carry trade run by the East India Company? They came to India, planted puppy, converted that to opium, took the opium to China, got the Chinese addicted to it, sold it there, made their profits, then came back to India, used those profits and that silver to buy the spices and the goods they needed out of India and take them back to Britain. Why did they need the carry trade? Because in the end, if you just kept purchasing things from India, you have a something called a balance of payments, a current account deficit to use modern terminology because there was nothing that the British were producing in the 18th century and before that the Indians wanted. The great British produce at the time that the East India Company set out to India was woolen clothing. Now, you can well imagine selling woolen clothing in a tropical country is a rather difficult thing to do. So, this was the first scam. The second scam was a scam of governance because the British realized that what, what they could not earn by trade, they could make by revenue by taxing the people toiling in India. So, they came up with the concept of divide and rule. You heard about it again and again and again, but you never really understood it. The reason is it is so insidious that it has been warped into our psychology and our minds, into our very, it seems, DNA that exorcising it is requiring so much time and effort. Curzon used that philosophy to divide Bengal in 1905. Then there were some Diobandis who took it up until it became the masterpiece of a man called Muhammad Ali Jinnah. He picked it up on a simple premise. Jinnah would never have been the father of modern India. That was always going to be Mahatma Gandhi. He at best could be a number two or a number three or one amongst many, which he did not want to be. Pride, power and ego matters. Let's not kid ourselves. And that pride, power and ego warped with the garbed ideology of the two nation theory led to the foundation of Pakistan and to the deaths of millions of people. But who was Muhammad Ali Jinnah? Where did he come from? In a history that we have forgotten but should not forget was that his father was a Gujarati Hindu. He married a Parsi. His daughter was a Parsi. And his grandchildren and great-grandchildren lived all their lives in India. Jinnah's family itself defied the two-nation theory. That's a lesson for all of us to now never forget a second time. I have with us on the conversation Neha Joshi representing the BJP, Ashok Sanjanar, former ambassador joining us on the broadcast, Professor Kapil Kumar, Sri Ayer and Madhav Nalapat stay on with us. Professor Kapil Kumar, Gujarati Hindu family, right? Until one day over an issue of vegetarianism and non-vegetarianism because his father was a fish trader that he decided to convert to Islam and on that basis we are told there is a two nation theory in this country? <laughs> it is not just that. See even after that don't forget that he was Tilak's advocate and Tilak is generally you know taken today as these Sarkari historians dubbed him as a Hindu extremist and all where he was a pure nationalist and all that. Also let us see that he did not support the Khilafat movement he has said that has nothing to do with India and all. But then the kind of egos, as you mentioned, you know, he wouldn't have been number two or number three or number four, which came up after 1927. Mm. And the role of many Congress leaders also in that, including Nehru, in that, propped up this whole thing, which led to a deliverance day in 1939 when the Congress ministry resigned, mm. then uh, direct action day in 1946 for that Pakistan demand and all. And uh, the funniest thing is uh, that by which aspect he still remained uh, a Muslim, though even having converted to Muslim, he used to drink, he would eat pork, he never knew Urdu, he never kept rosas, he never went to the mosque for prayers and all those things, all those aspects related to that. So it is pure egoistic politics also for which he used the fanaticism, he used the religion. 
to and got it through and yeah, got it through yeah, with the support difference. of the British. Okay, there was a difference, and let me let me pick up that difference with with Sri Ayer. Sri Ayer, there was a difference to in some things, and Nehru and Jinnah had much in common because both their daughters uh, fell in love with Parsis. Uh, the difference between Nehru was that he moved on with life. Uh, Jinnah then chose to disown her, having married a Parsi lady himself, who was the granddaughter of none other than a gentleman called Ratan Bhai Dada Boy Tata. She would have been aunt to the current Ratan Tata. Now from this family that hardly one generation before and some argue that in fact it was Jinnah who was converted after being born. This has planted in us the logic that India was two different countries and we have swallowed it for so long. Now how do we on a very personal basis say that it didn't make sense even for the Jinnah family? Absolutely. And, and there's also a small twist in, in yeah. history. Uh, Jinnah had practically retired to the United Kingdom in the 30s. He didn't want anything to do with India. He had retired in the countryside of England. And it was some erstwhile Nawabs who were furiously buying up property in what became Pakistan. These people went to him and, and impleded and you know told him, look, you need to come out of your retirement. We, the, the Muslim League party is looking to you for uh, leadership and so on, and the rest is history. But the, the most important, the telling thing here is that Jinnah was born a Hindu. I, I watched your video, and if he was born a Hindu and his father converted to uh, Islam after that, that is really, really, you know, that is very striking that the whole premise of this country was based on and piloted by one individual who himself wasn't even a Hindu by uh, a Muslim by birth. It's it's quite amazing because the, the, the story goes, and this is not a story being told by some Indians. These are biographies that have been written by Pakistanis included. That his father having an issue because his vegetarian clansmen were upset about him being a fish trader in a fit of anger, converted himself and his four sons the four sons being, 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 being what is now Muhammad Ali Jinnah and Professor Nalapath in the ultimate irony and I did not know this and when I googled it, it is very easy to find this information that the word Jinnah is actually coming from the Gujarati word Jinno which means, which means tall and skinny. I mean, if here we are, a person whose Islamic name which is identified with two nation theory is a Gujarati word for skinny because his parents were Hindu and they were called Bhai Jinno. Bhai being, of course, the uh, Gujarati nomenclature that is often used. Professor Nalapat, now, how important is it that we re-educate ourselves about these facts every time we doubt the syncretity of India? Well, I'd like to say how many people know how that Jinnah used to regularly have ham and eggs for breakfast. And how many people know that without a glass of scotch in the evening, I mean, that Jinnah would not retire. But for sometimes not one glass of scotch, but several, uh, apart from pipes. I mean, nobody knows this. How many people know that Jinnah was a few months away from death when Pakistan was announced? And that, frankly, it is surprising that, uh, that uh, the Congress leadership was not aware of it. When everybody around Jinnah was aware that the man was dying, I just want to point out, Rishabh, the reality is Mahatma Gandhi tried to keep India united. Jinnah worked to, to separate India into India and Pakistan. Hmm. Unfortunately, in this battle, Jinnah proved to be the winner. Okay. He won. But I, and let me also say one more thing. Right from the Khilafat movement onwards. No, no. Let me tell you one thing, Rishabh. Unfortunately, those who uh, run, used to have run our country, continued the two-nation theory. We continue to talk about minority <coughs> and majority as though they're two different species of human being. We, Mahatma Gandhi supported Khilafat. As someone correctly said, Jinnah did not support Khilafat. Mahatma Gandhi supported Khilafat, which was a Wahhabi movement. And for, for uh, unfortunately, the two-nation theory has been kept alive and well in India by arbitrarily saying Hindus should be treated differently from Muslims and including on Article 370. So the reality is it's not only Jinnah you know, mind -boggling. and the people who created Pakistan. 
we ourselves yeah because the the, the the pakistan that continues to be residing in our minds based on this two nation theory ambassador uh, uh, sajanhar joining us on the broadcast ambassador sajanhar punja bhai jinno was his gujarati father's name punja bhai jinno his name was punja lal thakkar and he came from a village in gujarat and of course with his pre partition india so going to the nearest biggest trading port which was karachi to set up your business was the logical thing to do and that's where they made their fortune as a family that they could afford to send mohammed uh, to lincoln's inn to study in england which as at that period of time would have been a very expensive thing to do uh, and if you see the photograph of jinna you can well imagine that if he looked like his father tall and skinny then he got this the the, the jinno gujarati subrike was well applied now if we forget this from our logic then we have to doubt ourselves in our ability to look beyond the brainwashing of to india well uh, yes uh, rishab you are very right in what you say and i think all the other panelists also let me sort of you know try to put uh, a, a slightly different perspective and that perspective is you know that we are saying that it was uh, Muhammad Ali Jinnah, of course, the roots that he came from and the may- manner in which he evolved. But uh, the one who helped him to evolve in this manner was the British, because it was the British who did not want to leave a united, independent India. They were set in their mind that they had to divide India into two; otherwise, it's going to become too powerful and too difficult to. for uh, them to deal with and manage mm. and that is how jinna was really propped up by them you know right now we use the term or rather in pakistan the term is used yeah, as a them. selected prime minister for imran khan mm. but i would say that you know going back to those times it was mohammad ali jinna who was selected by the british and he was propped up to uh, demand for a separate uh, muslim uh, nation because hindus and muslims could not survive together could not live together mm. although for centuries and possibly millennia since the time the muslims the arabs came here you know in the villages in uh, india hindus and muslims were living peacefully were living together were living no, in no because the same ambassador the same logic applies cordiality. you know i'm so i'm a i'm a punjabi now the community that we come from there was a tradition once that the eldest son often became a sikh so i'm a gulati and there are sikhs who are gulati just like virat kohli is is a indian cricketer he's hindu and manmohan singh kohli is the former prime minister of this country these were the syncretic logic supply here and a nes wadia who lives in this country very happily so is not disenfranchised i think his family is doing rather well for themselves uh, they have prospered in this country let me quickly open neha joshi neha joshi to get this no. message back across to a generation of young indians such as yourself and younger how important is it that even within the family the lie was busted uh thank you rishab i think uh, uh one thing that we are all clear about is that most muslims in fact all muslims in the subcontinent are uh, descendants of hindus you know the process of conversion started in the 8th century with the invasion of the afghans and it continued uh, we as a nation have withstood uh, uh, multiple invasions we have withstood slavery uh, you know uh, the uh, slavery by uh, the various like uh, muslim uh, invaders and also by the britishers but we somehow stood strong and uh, we uh, and when i say we i mean the the hindus the hindutva way of life for me it's a way of life this is all encompassing tolerant there is this country that we've been able to create which is tolerant where all the religions all the religious communities are not just present hmm. but they are thriving so i think that is what we need to propagate and preach it it is immaterial uh whether jinna was a hindu or a muslim or his father was a hindu or a muslim uh, it's interesting to know that that yes. information of course needs to be out there and i think you know maybe our textbook should be more explicit about it however i feel that what is more important to understand from this is as a country i mean you look at where pakistan is you look at where india is and then you look at religion as a way of life and what it 
teaches. Because I think one thing the that, that uh, I think a smart be thing that Dina Wadia certainly did was, and even though uh, you know she was divorced from her husband uh, even before independence, was that she said, "No, I'm going to have. I'm happily living on in Bom in Bombay. I don't need to go to Pakistan." And of course, later on in life, she was in in the United States, and her family here has thrived. Uh, so, the point comes, Professor Kapil Kumar, that at certain point of time. What is obvious needs to be hammered home because it doesn't sometimes register with people. No, no, because you've been brainwashed for so long, so it needs to be hammered home. No, How do we hammer it home? Uh, it's a must. Three points I want to make. Yesterday I was hearing a Pakistani channel hmm. on which this woman, you know, Pakistani activist was saying that I identify myself with the soil here in Pakistan. My ancestors were Hindus, they were Bauds and all. And we were all later on converted to Islam, you know. A very interesting statement coming out of her. Second thing, let me tell you, Jinnah's daughter, when she wanted to marry this Parsi, Jinnah said, there are one lakh Muslim boys in India. Why are you marrying a Parsi? And she retaliated by saying, that there were one lakh Muslim women in the country. Why did you marry my mother, who's a Parsi? And the kind of resistance Jinnah had for her daughter's marriage to Parsi, the same resistance was found by Nehru when Indira Gandhi wanted to ma marry Feroz. And then Feroz and Indra go to Gandhi. And that is how Gandhi, today's Gandhi family gets their name from Gandhi. When Gandhi said, okay, I adopt Feroz, I gave him the name Gandhi. And that's how that marriage took place. Well, his original pass, Parsi name was, was a different yeah, yeah, way yeah, to pronounce yeah, yeah, and write yeah, yeah, Gandhi. Yeah, yeah, that's, uh, that's what I'm yes, saying. Yes. But the more important aspect here is that it's like what this Rio Khanna is doing in America today. These Hindus, they sold out for different reasons. No, but the, and after selling the, out, the, the point I'm, you know, the larger point that he needs to be, you know, sort of just, sort of just buried in. And for the last time, I'm hoping in a generation will this be required, uh, once and for all, Professor Nalapath, that this conceptualization, what has been brainwashed to us, and so deeply so, we were talking about the Stockholm syndrome just a, a, a few minutes ago, Vishri Iyer, this is ours, that it is so sunk <coughs> into us. That even the best of us who can't see the logic sometimes buy it. Yes, that there are problems between Hindus and Muslims living in this country. When the real problems were between the Crusaders, the times of the Richard the Lionhearts and the Saladins of the world. And they never existed in the subcontinent. The First World War didn't start here. The Second World War didn't start here. The Crusades didn't start here. None of that happened here. Now, how do we remind ourselves about these things? Well, Rishabh, you're perfectly right. And I, I think, you know, we do need to uh, uh, remind ourselves of these things. But may I point out that Muhammad Ali Jinnah was a very, very smart tactician. Mm. He supported the British throughout the 1939-1945 war. Correct. When the Congress leadership was moving here and there, sometimes sounding pro-German, sometimes pro-Japanese, and very seldom sounding pro-British. So actually, I, I date the, the impetus to Pakistan in Whitehall from that period of 1939, when, mm. frankly, the British thought that the Hindus are not reliable, quote unquote, mm. Mm. and Churchill expressed that. The Muslims are reliable friends of ours. So let's give them a Muslim state. Frankly, it was a tactical errors made by the freedom fighters in India that resulted in Jinnah succeeding okay, in Pakistan. Okay, and subsequently all the tactical errors. And he won the game. It, 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 subsequently all the tactical errors, uh, Ambassador Sajanhar, a little bit of reading of history, which is not, yours will be greater than mine, was within 10 years, the first 10 years, Pakistan was doomed. They couldn't put together a constitution. Uh, you had pe people like Sikandar Mirza who were, who, who propped up Ayub Khan. Uh, they scrapped the Constituent Assembly. The Governor General became uh, President themselves. Then there was a martial law imposed as early as 1958. So we are looking at disaster within the first 10 years. What could have been different, sir? No, you see, uh, it is basically what is the fundamental basis on which Pakistan has been created. Pakistan has been created and even till today, it is driven forward by the philosophy of being what India is not. So being anti-Indian, hmm. doing everything that uh, India does, doing exactly the reverse and exactly the opposite. So it measures itself always 
in a manner that whatever India is doing, it should do something opposed to it or against it. And I think that is the reason why you've had all these problems. That is the reason why over the last uh, uh, 70 plus years, hmm. there is not a single prime minister in Pakistan which has been able to, who has been able to complete her or his term of five years. Yeah, not but, a single yeah. uh, till, till date. And there are at least six uh, army chiefs who have been, a, you know, got extensions whenever they have been appointed. <laughs> well, so basically, we, we politely as call it far extension. as the balance of power is concerned, it's rather than being with the civilians, it has always been with the army and with the uh, intelligence agencies. And, 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 the, and, the, and the point that needs and to be hammered home is that the foundation of something... Is, is literally the English word foundation means it is the foundation upon which the building has to be built. If the foundation itself is fundamentally flawed, the building will always be rickety and that has been the definition of Pakistan because Jinnah was dead by 1948. The Muslim League, which was Jinnah's party, its game was over exactly. by 1954 and then that's it. And nothing, Pakistan hasn't been able to look back after that for the next 70 odd years. Uh, Neha Joshi, just come in on this. Because how do we now go about educating young Indians, the next generation, people who are in schools and colleges, and understand that this fundamental logic of a one India needs to be taught from literally day one. And these stories need to be now told in the reverse order. Okay, just I've lost that thought. Professor Kavrukumar, take that. Take that thought. How do, we, how do we teach our kids now so that we don't have to have this education exercise ever again? You see, only in my life, once in arguments, I was beaten by a Korean. When I asked him about North Korea, South Korea, he said, you Indians, you accepted the partition of this country by a colonial government. We Koreans have not accepted it. Hmm. We'll be there one day. We'll be together. Hmm. Now, this whole concept in relation to what is India, what India stands for, what are we, mm. it has to come out to the Indians. Mm. Why do we teach in our history books creation of Pakistan? Why don't we say that India was cut into Pakistan? Absolutely right. I think why don't we say that? This why is the, the, why it's, should it's we say a, in history a, books that Pakistan was it, created? It's, it's a thought process. We should say it's the psyche which and, matters. And thought process matters a lot. Imagine all mm. of you every day, just think of your day-to-day -day lives, how you think and how you feel really, really matters. And if you are able to look at facts, then able to look at the larger picture, these ideological concepts, they start withering away. And that's when the moment of epiphany happens. And if this country needs one last thing, one last thing on its road to be a power to be reckoned with in the globe where its place in history needs to be, this moment of epiphany is required other than the economic growth and the military growth which is happening, have India that moment of epiphany. We leave it there. Good night. For more such videos, subscribe to the NewsX YouTube channel, hit the bell icon.